Well, hello there. Welcome back to the Agassino Zinga Show. This is episode number 225 with me, your host, Agostino Zinga. How's it going? How are you feeling? As you can tell by the background and by the sound of my uh, very audible voice, it is now sometime late in the evening on an unspecified day in an unspecified location and i'm your host in front of you here of a cheap microphone and a cheap webcam talking the absolute most you know xyz hope you guys are well rested hydrated all that malarkey good good to know how am i i'm feeling great amazing thanks for asking um <laughs> as you can tell i've got my little hd podcast ready haircut on today right got not well had a haircut didn't get it put on my head unfortunately this would be could would be quite gnarly actually if i had like this is all fake it's like a wig that i put on you know those kind of instagram pages that you get where people spray on their hair this could be gnarly if that was it right i guess there'll be no way um girls get a bit more well i know some black girls get a bit more offended when people touch their hair and stuff and poke around and say oh my god this you know when the old caucasian comes around and starts poking around your hair but there's not really an occasion where a dude, I think for the most part, gets their hair tugged or gets scraped for the most part. I don't really have that happen to me more often than not. No, not really. So I think you could probably get away with having a little bit of a glued afro on, couldn't you? Because no one would actually know unless, you know, your mates from the hood who kind of known you for all your life, you know, knew you could never grow a, a box and an afro. You just turn around and just turn up to the ends one day. They'd be like, hey. What the hell's going on with your hair? Do you know what I mean? No one's going to have it. If it was net ends, no one's going to have it. But I think day-to-day life, no one really kind of clock you had a fake head on. But anyway, it's not fake. It's real. Got my hair cut today. So feeling mighty fresh. Hence the late podcast, I think, you know. Got to, got, to, got to get this thing on camera whilst it's still fresh. One day, I've still got all the little, you know, dust bits of again on my finger there. As you can see, maybe you can zoom in and out. But anyway, that's it. So um, this is part two of the part one of the podcast and part one dropped earlier on today so thanks for the other guys that checked that out nice to see you to see you nice not malarkey just trying to get back on a train man as per usual innit? i've been a bit slack in these last couple of weeks due to other extenuating circumstances but you know excuses 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 aren't something that i'm very much used to so we're gonna skip past that get straight into the topics and start banging it out in it because why not why the bloody hell not um short updates what i've been up to oh i watched uh once upon a time in hollywood actually that was a an incredibly a thoroughly enjoyable movie i'm sure most of you guys are aware of once upon in one of once upon a time in hollywood um a movie directed by quentin tarantino that was loosely based around the manson murders right um charles manson i'm sure you guys are aware was one of the most well-known serial killers of his time even though he didn't personally kill anyone he um was able to somehow cajole or to somehow how you say mm, cajole somehow brainwash a group of young people in the 60s to go and murder um high or well, well-known celebrities within Hollywood as some sort of form of protest, you know, the swing in the 60s, people were trying LSD, people were shagging all over the place, so maybe in within that kind of mist and that confusion, he kind of slipped in there. I've actually got a book called Helter Skelter, which I still haven't read, it's over there somewhere on the shelf, that kind of details um, the entire ordeal and kind of gives some background story onto it, which I haven't kind of got through to reading, but essentially the book is, Quint- the movie is Quentin Tarantino's way of maybe reinterpreting the story or telling it in a different light it's not like for like there's not, there are some elements in it that are true but for the most part it's kind of quintility and interpretation of it and for me personally i'm not sure i think the guardian gave it five and again i'm not i don't i resist watching or reading film reviews um i think for the most part film reviews are like music reviews it's all subjective everyone's got their own taste and especially nowadays where for the most part on social media you've got quite a lot of people who are very knowledgeable i follow this guy on my twitter feed who's called kyle some black dude who's amazingly knowledgeable on cinema and he really gives some great insights into movies uh themes and camera shots and character development bits that you might have missed that's that really gives um added kind of layer and texture to a movie that you haven't you've seen maybe previously but for the most part i try to avoid it and just try to go into the movies kind of blind and see where i go from there and especially in my case i'm not very much of a I'm not a movie buff in any way, shape, or form. 
I've kind of just watched whatever's there. And for the most part, I don't really have the patience to sit down and watch movies. But over the last few months, I've been slowly but surely changing that. I think movies are a great way to kind of glean inspiration. It's a great kind of um, social commentary. makes you think about things. Again, takes you out of your day-to-day monotony of life. But it just takes a bit of effort because you have to put this bad boy down, right? Your smartphone. You've got to put that down and just kind of lock in and watch the movie. And I haven't made, I don't think I've been able to do that, actually. All the movies I've watched, I think I picked up my phone at least once. Except for watching it at the cinema. When I'm in the cinema, I'm quite conscious of not touching my phone. But when I'm watching it at home, it's like quite difficult to kind of stay off your phone. But for the most part, I watched it. Um, I watched the entire movie in the cinema. Didn't touch my phone the entire time. And yeah, thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, a real good feel-good movie, which you wouldn't necessarily say. Quentin Tarantino makes feel-good movies for the most part. Maybe Kill Bill is a good one. Maybe Django. I don't think they feel good movies, but you know what I mean, right? In the in the most gruesome, macabre, dark twisted way that he can make a film good movie. And there's a lot of nods to his inspiration growing up. I think if you are familiar with Quentin Tarantino's interviews, you'd know that he's a big fan of slapstick west of spaghetti western, sorry. Slapstick's comedy. Um spaghetti western. So he kind of loads of little hints at or loads of themes running in there through, you know, spaghetti westerns, um, the character arc of Leonardo DiCaprio's character. Um, Brad Pitt's character is amazing. Um, all the cameos in it from all the actors, especially the dude from Justified, absolutely smashed it. Really good movie. And again, um, uh, from what I gleaned from it, again, I haven't read any it, reviews or had had knowledge, had the luxury of going for any of the YouTube breakdown videos, but it seemed to me like it was a celebration of American cinema. This movie was like his kind of way to say thank you to Hollywood for all the good that they've done for him and his career. And a kind of a way of him kind of quote unquote giving back, acknowledging all the greats that have come before him and kind of laid the front groundwork for him to be, you know, as successful as he is nowadays. And this makes complete sense, right? Quentin Tarantino is a, is a quintessential film buff. Like, you know, if you watch interviews of him talking about movies, it just, it just makes you want to download a ton and not watch them, right? Because he just, he's so passionate about what he does. And it obviously comes through him, his performances. But yeah, Margot Ruby in it is absolutely stunning as Sharon Tate. She plays the role really well. Again, I don't really understand the backlash behind that. There's a lot of backlash behind her not really saying many things or not having many lines. But I think as a presence on film or in, in front, on the screen, sorry, um, how she carried her role, some of the shots of her legs walking by, of her midriff coming across the street, that like just really cute and, and I did warm kind of bits and pieces that made you really fall in love with LA and that kind of Hollywood era in general and again I just love the optimism of it there was so much hope in this movie which you know especially nowadays with the bleak times that we're in socially and politically like I think this was again a real good in in the, in the best way possible this was a feel good a feel good movie right if, especially if you've seen this scene you'd know what I'm talking about but yeah for those of you who haven't watched it I highly recommend you check it out one of my favorite movies of the year can I say that? I haven't really watched any other good movies, but let me say it's my favorite movie of the year for the most part. Um, Quentin Tarantino's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Um, I recommend you check it out. One of my, yeah, again, stellar, stellar performances throughout. Loads of great cameos. You know what you should do? Try and watch it without finding out who the cameos are and just go into it blind. I know I mentioned the Justified Dude, but that's about it. But try and go into it blind. It'll surprise you completely. Be like, oh my God, wow, look, at, look, look who's in it, look who's in it. You check it out. It'll be really, really cool. But yeah, um, great movie. Huge fan of Quentin Tarantino. Everything does there. So yeah, recommend you check that one out if you've got the time. Um, what is next on the list here? We have Juicy Smollett. Can he come back from this? Now, this is a story that I know most people have kind of, you know, forgotten about and kind of moved on from, which I can completely understand. I think Juicy Smollett took a, or as her, <laughs> David Chappelle called him, on his special, what do you call it? Juicy Smollier. Did he do that because he didn't want to get sued? Juicy Smollier? That maybe that's why, right? He pronounced it completely different. But um I'm sure most of you guys are aware of that whole entire story that transpired. Was it this year or was it last year? Time has gone by so quick. I'm not sure if it was this year or last year, but we all know the story, you know. He he allegedly it seems as if Juicy Smollett might have faked um a race a hate crime against him right um specifically because he's maybe homosexual and because he's black um supposedly or allegedly the findings is that he hired these two nigerian actors who are also co-starring with him on chicago on sorry, on, on the empire to um you no know, beat him up rough him up time of a noose on his neck pour bleach over him 
and screamed, this is MAGA country, right? The story kind of crumbled um, along the way. He did loads of embarrassing things, saying he's a gay Tupac, going on that Good Morning America show, um, just loads of really sketchy stuff. And in the end, anyway, um, somehow through his, um, you know, through his really high, through his ex- in- intense connections to the city of Chicago and, you know, the good graces that he might have with some people in the upper echelons, he got completely let off um, his charges to the dismay of a lot of people. But it seems as if people in Chicago or the police department, for the most part, just aren't letting this one go. And they're, just, they're trying their darndest to get him back into court. And another <laughs> another kind of uh, bit of the story um, came out the other day. And I'll get this up on the screen so we can go through it. But yeah, I just it just got me thinking about whether or not he can make a comeback and whether or not it's, it's ever going to end for him. Is he ever going to see... If he, is, this, is this story ever going to just like stop happening? Or, or is this going to keep rumbling and rumbling and rumbling and rumbling and rumbling? So this is a story from Yahoo News. I think it's from KFSN Fresno. We'll quickly listen to the video and hear what they have to say about it. But... I don't know if I should just mill it what I'll do, man. I'm not sure what I'll do in his position. Because you know for sure no one believes you, right? You know everyone thinks that you're completely lying and it's a complete fake story. But in some way, shape, or form, well, you know, so nowadays it doesn't seem like people want to... People that nowadays don't really want to fess up to their wrongs, right? I, I remember, I think, hearing someone say on social media the other day, like, um, made me laugh. People nowadays are wrong and, str- wrong, and strong, right? They double down on their wrongness. They don't want to admit it. Um, They'd rather double down and hope that it blows over than just admit. Because maybe admitting in their eyes makes you seem weak. Maybe it draws more attention to your lies in the first place. I don't know. But there is not... There is... There's a lack of honesty. Really in truth. But for the most part, no one tries to speak truth. Um, A lot of misspeaking as well, right? No one's really careful or precise with their words, right? People are just throwing stuff out there and hoping no one notices for the most part, which, you know, isn't necessarily a good way to go about life. So for just a small minute, you're 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 kind of wary as if, like, would he want to apologize and does he have a need to? I don't think so. The only other thing that would maybe sway in his direction of apologizing is if um, all his Hollywood friends, you know, his, you know, um, what's his name? that daniels do that that directs empire oprah and all those kind of people if they sort of like blacklist him or he's kind of ostracized from that sort of community maybe that might employ him to kind of apologize but i don't know i think he has enough intelligent people in his circle that could advise him and would have advised him differently and he still chose to do what he did so i think he's probably just you know too far down you know when you just lie so much you have to just stick with the lie there is no going back um you know, even though I don't agree with it, I think you should do, you, there should come a point where you should hold your hands up. But I think he's at a point now where there's just no turning back. But interesting developments on this news article. Let's have a quick listen and hear what they have to say regarding it. Do, 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 do. Let's get up here on the screen. Um, and then play on here. Mm-hmm. You have to say it there. Well, what's happening here? Come on. These other sites are always the worst. So it's about money, I'm assuming, right? The resources used in order to kind of keep this case going. Let's see what this is. Let's see. Wow. What is going on with this, man? Jesus Christ. This Yahoo News article thing is not the best way to listen to news. Um, and Terrell, the city of Chicago go. wants their money back. Officials say false claims of an attack made by actor Jussie Smollett cost the city more than $130,000 wow. spent on investigating. It also shows you how little police officers get paid. After a thorough investigation, authorities came to the conclusion that Smollett knew his alleged attackers and staged the whole thing as charges against him were dropped. That is nuts. Two Nigerian dudes. Detectives working hundreds of hours of overtime over two weeks. And that's not all. Smollett may be facing even more trouble. A hearing is set for this Friday in addition to the one today in which a special prosecutor could be assigned to further investigate the Smollett case, meaning 
there is a small chance that Smollett could be recharged. Now, that's that's the nightmare, right, for Jason Smollett, because you think it's never over. Again, I think he did it probably at the wrong time. You know the whole like um, outrage culture and cancel culture that's going on. He probably just missed it by a few months. If he would have done this a few months earlier, the sympathy would have been more pronounced. He would have had more support maybe from the black community because it was quite evident. I think um, Dave Chappelle mentioned he's special too. It was pretty obvious that for the most part, outside of his close friends, most people within the quote unquote black hip hop community or entertainment community stayed completely quiet behind that situation because it just seemed like an absolute hoax, right? It seemed fishy from the moment we heard the news get leaked. So, if anything, he didn't have any kind of good graces in the community that he needed the most. And then as soon as it went out to the, you know, everyday folk, it's like from that, you know that saying or how your parents are, where they're like, oh, never let never let people outside your house see that you and your brother are arguing, right? or you and your siblings are arguing. Because the whole idea is you want to keep a united house. You want to present a united house outside of your home or united front. But then indoors, you know, no one has any idea what kind of, um, what kind of, uh, how many stripes you guys are peeling off of each other in the household. But outside of it, you try and kind of, you know, keep a united force in order to kind of make sure no one knows that there's um, divisions in the camp. But now everyone knows the divisions in the camp. The prosecutors know that. The police force know that. They're suing him. He's trying to, they're trying to pull him back into court. It's an absolute horror show for the lad. But I would like to see a redemption story. I really would. I think... Uh, Jesse Smollett redemption story would probably be quite cool. I think people realizing that, um, especially someone in his position, him you know being a per- people a person of color, being somebody that's from the LGBTQ plus community, and you know the fact that he wore those identities so loudly and proudly as lapels on his jacket, right? He was I, he identified himself um, first by that group as opposed to an individual. I think it'd be quite cool to hear him kind of reject those tags and reject those um you know those ways of thinking and maybe try to encourage people to come together more um to not be so divisive to not use um the labels that he has or the labels that he's been bestowed or labels that he was born with in order to kind of drive the vision more or to kind of make him other or to separate him from everybody else um, that would be pretty cool to see him maybe talk about cancel culture and to maybe talk about his own experience, right? He was at the top of the mountain, right? He was on Empire, one of the, you know, one of the most four, you know, the one of the number one shows within the black or hip hop community. It, and then it kind of seeped over to the to the kind of general public. It became big there too. And just as it was kind of maybe there were rumblings about there being another season, he decides to do that and he completely fucks up everybody else's hopes of getting another season on that show and let let's um put aside his own role in his own profession his own kind of career being completely put on ice but imagine the amount of people he's put out of work right luckily i think maybe for tv and entertainment or whatever maybe maybe there's a possibility to jump from set to set maybe if you were a production manager working with these people you probably could help them out and bring them on a couple other sets or you know call some people call some favors but imagine the amount of work he stopped for people that were just doing their job through his own little selfish act allegedly that's the issue so if he could come back i think that would be a really good comeback story and i would be all ears because i think maybe in america more so and less so maybe in the uk but i think they do love a good redemption story they do love the whole idea behind somebody you know being completely shamed in public being completely embarrassed losing everything um family money whatever it may be called and then suddenly coming back and coming back a different person not coming back the same person right you don't want that that's that's not really a redemption story that's not really a good um character arc or anything right there's no hero's journey but coming back a different person a different perspective like showing or telling people stories of what you've seen on the other side right how bad it can get if you decide to stick with the whole idea behind you're an ostracized or marginalized person because that's the thing that makes it funny with the just Miller thing right or makes it really sad in one case well in one sense he's saying he's oppressed right in another sense he gets off all these charges because he's privileged it's like you know that is maybe the dichotomy of life that we're living in at the moment right this idea that you're one thing but you're also the other thing on equal levels it's not even it's not it's not even like one is higher than the other no on equal levels you are marginalized and maybe you might be ostracized and maybe you might be looked down upon because of your sexual orientation that could be true and because of your color that could also be true but there's also 
an undeniable fact that you have, you know, judges, prosecutors, lawyers, high film executives, movers and shakers, connectors, whatever they may be called, in your back pocket if you need to get some charges dropped. It's insane. It's insane. Um, so, yeah, let's see. I hope he makes a comeback personally. I, I would be interested to hear what his story is and how he kind of went about um, navigating through Hollywood after you've become the black sheep. Because I also think that's a story that doesn't really get spoken about too often, right? When you make a mistake and you try and come back in Hollywood, how do those people that, you know, you for well, you know for sure kind of, you know, iced you out, stopped answering your calls, didn't like, stop liking your tweets, unfollowing Instagram. What's that like when you suddenly get back on and you see them all creeping back, slivering back into into your good graces? If that was me, I'd step on them like ants, but I know some people are a little bit different, but that was what I would do. Um, next on the docket here, what do we have? We have the Conor McGregor story. Hmm. This is old news, I think, for most of you who are um, internet savvy. You'll be aware that Conor McGregor, the once UFC champion, is now going around beating up old men, it seems like, because he has nothing else better to do. Um, the reaction to this has been quite interesting. Um, Joe Rogan, my hero, someone that I look up to, um, came out and said something that I thought was a bit insensitive. But again, I think if you're Joe Rogan and you got fuck you money, I think we have to be aware, you know. But that's the, that's the dream. We all want f you money right that's what we want f you money joe joe rogan um mentioned the other day that he thinks that punch wasn't that big of a deal i think he mentioned it when he was doing tom papa the recent episode and um now he kind of went back and kind of walked back and said he kind of misspoke but he said it wasn't just that much of a big deal a bit of a tap on the head but looking at the video it looks like a big punch it looks like he went in there and winded up now the reasons behind it no one really knows people are saying it's because the dude didn't want uh to drink uh conor mcgregor's whiskey I don't know if that's actually true, but that's the rumors going around the hood or going around the into of the hood as if I'm in the hood, same hood as um, Conor McGregor. But the rumors on the internet is that he didn't want to drink the whiskey or he rejected the whiskey shot of his proper 12 and so Conor McGregor punched him in the head. Um, let's see. So this, this is the video. I'm going to mute it. So hopefully it doesn't get taken down, but it probably will do still. But this is a video from TMZ. So we've got a video here of Conor McGregor walking into a random pub in Ireland, I'm assuming, right? Because there's mad white guys with grey hair sitting at a dilapidated pub. And the only person that kind of gets semi-excited when he walks in is the bar girl behind the bar, right? Everyone else is sort of like, you know, just hanging on to their life. And they're all drinking pints of, I don't know, probably Carlsberg, right? So he rocks up there and, you know, his trademark tight, long sleeve singlet thing that he always wears. And then he's trying to get a proper 12 from the bar lady. She probably gets a bottle. Um, he buys one. He tries to give everyone shots. I think he tells the one of the guys, the guy shots, he doesn't want it. Oh, he pushes. Yeah, he pushes the. the oh, yeah, there we go. That's what happens. He gives the guy the glass. The guy gets the glass and pushes it back into the. He doesn't want the glass, right? And then Conor McGregor gets the glass and dashes it back on the table. So I'm assuming that's the way the beef starts, right? And Conor's arguing with the dude. The dude's like, no, fuck off. I don't want your fucking whiskey. Cool. Kind of pause it anyway. Left handed, of course. They're drinking. The bar is smiling, right? She's happy. And then look, he punches the guy in the head. <laughs> that is some rock star shit. That's part of me, honestly. That's why I'm, 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 I'm upset Joe Rogan walked it back. But there's part of me that's sort of like... This guy's a martial arts, a mixed martial arts fighter, right? For the most part, he's, you know, you have to have a couple screws loose to agree to go into a cage and fight another man with your elbows, knees, and fists, right? It's a profession for only a certain kind of man. For the most part, we are lucky. We're, we're, I would say humanity is lucky that most fighters are able to keep their fist with it with a, you know away from regular civilians they're able to keep you know, dignify themselves and only fight in a ring we're lucky that that's that's a thing but i think this idea that you know mma fighters are gonna not be like this is a bit naive i think right there's a lot you know you've only got to go to any metropolitan city um main strip and see you know some ketted out drunk dudes who you know get the bit of Dutch courage in them and they want to start swinging at everyone right and they don't really have anything to back it up they don't have anything they don't have any training they don't have any they don't have a, a fight record they don't have 
a reputation. They have nothing, but they, and they think they can go out there and fight. How much more for somebody like Conor McGregor in a pub like this, surrounded by dudes who, you know, I'm pretty sure even at Conor McGregor's size, he could probably knock everyone out in that bar, right? So again, I think that that's one thing to claim into it. You know, rock star shit. He's an MMA fighter. But the other thing as well, this goes to show just how dangerous it is to earn loads of money really, really quickly. Because would he kind of be doing this if he was still, if this was post uh, flow, if this was pre flow Mayweather fight? I don't think so. I think the fact that he got paid upwards of a hundred million dollars, right, um, to his bank account, um, considering the MMA fighters don't get paid that much money anyway. He got paid actual real life. He got paid um, actual life-changing money. For Mayweather, that's like an everyday thing, right? Most of these fights are money fights, hence the name, money, Mayweather. But for the most part, and most boxing guys do get paid pretty well, MA fighters don't for the most part, right? Didn't the last um, UFC just passed, what did um, Stipe get for knocking out um, Daniel Cormier? What, 500 grand, right? They get paid absolute pittance. Of course, there's bonuses on top of that, but he got paid so much money that he's now in a position where he's bored, right? He got beaten by Khabib Nurmagomedov, right? Absolutely smashed. There's no need to do a rematch because, you know, we know what the result's going to be. Um, he's never going to be able to beat him and unless maybe Khabib retires before Conor fights again. So he's in a situation where he'll be, he's going to try and... Imagine trying to train, waking up at 5 in the morning, jogging on the streets, right? Uh, putting in your hours, doing your burpees, hitting the heavy bag, Right? all that malarkey and having a hundred mil in a bank it's very difficult to do right that's why they say you know most fighters aren't born in silk sheets right there has to be a bit of darkness a bit of grit there has to be that sort of like Deontay Wilder um laser focused um dedication to the cause right there wasn't his daughter diagnosed with an illness or something where he had to kind of he didn't have the money to um get the, get the treatment that she needed so it was so it was basically black and white, right? If I continue doing this crappy job here, I won't be able to pay for it, and she might potentially die. If I take do the risk and try and become a professional fighter, I could make more money than God and Pacific, you know, and maybe kind of you know um, ensure my family's future from generations to come. It's easy decision to make, but it comes from a really dark place, right? You don't have anything else. For Conor McGregor to suddenly now start training and fighting again, it's difficult, and now we're seeing the evidence of it. He's acting now. He smashed that dude's phone the other day. The smashing of the phone wasn't that bad, but I think the smashing of the phone then stamping on it was crazy. There's all the other allegations I'm not even going to get into. Then there's this fight. It just seems really, really nuts. It supposedly happened a while back ago, last April or something. Um, the dude isn't pressing charges, obviously, because, you know, it's Ireland, small knit community. If he presses charges, you know, his family's probably going to be in all sorts of bother that he doesn't probably need. And I'm sure Conor McGregor, in his gentlemanly way might, might have um corrected the situation and slipped the guy a, a little pr- brown paper bag i don't know anything but i would assume that probably happened but yeah this goes to show you man the number one mma fighters we're lucky that they are not unhinged like conor mcgregor and they try and keep their you know they're fighting to the octagon and number two it shows you just how dangerous it is to go from having very little money to a lot of money right it wasn't conor mcgregor signing on as well that's his that's his origin story right he was signing on for a period of time so to go from that to this to have your own whiskey where you can rock up to a bar right it's probably a dream of his i'm assuming rocking up to a bar in ireland somewhere and pouring your own whiskey to go from that for go to go from you know from signing on to a job center to pouring your own whiskey in a bar and then having some old dude refuse you again i wouldn't hit the old dude i just i don't know okay he didn't want it and just keep it moving but i don't know man uh, he he has done an apology so far. He went on Ariel Hawani's show and kind of sat there and, you know, somebody tried to walk it back a bit. But I don't know. I'm not sure if I'm not... I, I don't know how mad I am about this. I, I quite enjoy the fact that we have some people of a uh, high stature who are a bit nuts and do things a bit, you know, un- uh, a bit unconventional, for lack of a better term. Um, but I'm also aware that, you know, you just can't go around punching people in the head because they don't want to drink your whiskey. Like, that is absolutely unacceptable really isn't it <laughs> it really is I don't, know, again, I don't know why i'm laughing but imagine being this old guy in a pub just enjoying your pint look i don't want a whiskey not because he didn't like it maybe he just didn't want to taste the whiskey in his mouth he wanted to drink his carlsberg and all of a sudden you're getting punched in the head like by an mma fire <laughs> it's just i don't know man these guys man they have honestly that's what happens when you just have too much money and not enough hobbies or whatever it may be called um 
You just do this weird shit. But yeah, um, get well soon, the dude. I'm sure he's better. Um, and yeah, what, what's Connor doing? I don't know what's next up for him, but you know, we'll, he'll he'll figure it out. Um, what else is happening here? Oh, this is a good little topic. Actually, I saw something on Mixmag that I thought was quite cool. Let me see if I can get it up on here. But yeah, these guys are crazy, aren't they? They're all absolutely crazy. Oh, you know what we're gonna do? Actually, let me let me. I'll check two things. Let me see if I can find it. So, boom. And then number two, there's this event. So I'm not sure what you guys are up to in the weekend, but this weekend I think I'm heading off to Oval Space or Pickle Factory for a little shubby shub shub. Um, I think it's for where's the events here? Most of these places. Let me see if I can find it. it's on the Friday, right? Yeah, I'm probably gonna do that on the Friday. I think that might make more sense. So on the Friday we have where is it? Yeah, we have the pickle factory with Ona Oza um, from 11 to 6, him playing all night long. So, pickle factory, I'm sure you guys are aware, is basically where Oval Space is, um, one of my fave venues in London. Um, again, it's a bit weird, Oval Space, because it's those kind of places where, how do I say, um, the security is a bit touch, the security is a bit heavy handed, but once you're in, it's fairly. You know, it's it's smooth sailing for the most part. You're not gonna get any more trouble than that. You just need to get in for the most part, right? But getting in is the hardest bit. Um, there's usually massive queues if it's really a success, big night. Um, the good thing about it because it's sort of like on a roundabout, you get to see exactly where you're on the queue. I don't know if that makes sense, but you know sometimes when you're in the queue at a place and it bends around the corner, you have no idea where you are. But this at least is in a roundabout thing, so you get to see exactly where you are for the most part. They try and keep everyone single file. They usually have a guest list queue if you've got a guest list and all that malarkey. Um, sound system is fairly decent. I think for the most part, the bar is extremely expensive, but I wouldn't say extremely expensive, but it's just, you know, it's priced like X or Y and Phonics, all those places, right? So you're going to get it's probably like a fiver for a beer, six quid for a mixer, or seven maybe more. Um, so, you know, standard sort of um, those kind of places, prices for the most part, but yeah i'm a big fan of the oval space pickle factory i'm not sure if pickle factory is the one next to it or oval space is the one or it's the same thing and they close it but oval space is massive and it probably won't be oval space probably will be the one just to the left of it as you go in um we could actually check it out here actually before we start debating about what the pickle factory is the pickle factory so you can get up on google images i'm pretty sure i've been in there that's the smaller one on the side right I'm pretty sure. Yeah, that's the one I've been to. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I've been there. That is the one I've been to. One million percent. So, yeah, um, if you're in the hood, I recommend you come and check it out. I'll get it up here. Show the spaces. This is the pickle factory for you guys to see. Essentially what it sort of looks like. So, yeah, it's a smaller venue for the most part. Let's see where, the, where it is. So, it's, it's located within Oval Space, right? The pickle of Oval Space. The pickle factory... So in 2013, we expanded the community we have created in our little corner of Tower Hamlets by taking over an old industrial location in disused space directly opposite uh, Oval Space. Once a pickup factory in London's covered, da -da -da, the warehouse then became a medical supply center, now a blank canvas. Okay, cool. So what's the capacity of this place? I'm assuming it's like two, 500 people, maybe 200 people. What do you guys think? Or you, have to, you have to download, you have to sign or something. I don't know what the capacity is of it is. It gets so shivy up here, right? Shouldn't it? What's the capacity? Come on, son. I think 150, 200 capacity. So, okay, so a fairly small venue. But yeah, I think that's that That will be me for the weekend. So check that out if you're around on Friday. Um, What else is going on with moi? Oh, that's what I was going to check you. The Mix Mag article. This is a pretty good article regarding Nights Out. So Mixmag always do some good articles I like to speak about on here that I've mentioned a few times. I think that I've got some good traction. So let's talk about this one. This is a great little article. Um, it's called Why Day Parties Are Taking Over Dance Music. The, and the subtitle is The Joys of Daytime Partying. Uh, and Mirad says Joss Baines and he's not alone. Um, so daytime partying. I've had a bit of a conflicted uh, kind of journey with daytime partying. I got involved in it heavy with the old um, Lost in the Woods and all those kind of guys that were putting on parties and, you know, in the woods around Hackney Wick and stuff and Once the Flats. 
there was loads of other kind of parties that they're doing under the bridge there's parties they're doing now under the bridge in canning town that are really popular so loads of cool things that i was kind of you know going to but again they were a bit heavy um they weren't for the most mature of crowd they just invited mongheads basically to come and get absolutely smashed and it didn't necessarily um call for a very it didn't really encourage a conducive environment for you to listen to music or you know to connect with people and stuff it was just more so about just extending the night and just staying out and getting fucked which necessarily isn't a bad thing but necessarily something i'm looking to do every weekend so day parties now i kind of equate them similarly to fest you know people when they i think um i think it might be phonics or somebody or phonica someone did like a festival which was essentially just a day party you start from the in the midday and you end at kind of like just before you know closing time it's a good way number one to get loads of djs on to play right to kind of cover that space it's also a good way to kind of maybe promote local talent and it's also a good way to invite to potentially have more people more di- a, a more diverse crowd at your event than you usually would if you had it going from 11 to 6 at the event i'm going to at pickle factory right so that's usually the premise behind it but i think nowadays especially in london it has more to do with the fact that the rising you know not the rising per- the rising price of rent but also the licensing laws in most bars are a bit you know behind the times or they're not willing to go with the times so the only way to get around it is to kind of push your event early and early and earlier but this article is a good way of describing it let's kind of read it through so um just bane says the following in standing i'm standing in a club jane fitz is dropping bomb after um is dr- dropping bomb after utterly perfect bomb every record hurtling the room closer to the sort of transcendental moment of ecstasy of aesthetic communal release that you only envisaged as being an actual possible thing that can happen when you're surrounded by people on ecstasy while in ecstasy i'm thinking about alan bennett i'm thinking about alan bennett and buttery toast and orange juice and sunday brunch and barreling into the nearest greg's knowing full well i'm stumbling out with a triple chocolate donut and a steak cheese roll clutched to my chest I'm thinking about the Cory Omnibus, the freshly laundered pyjama bottoms. In short, I no longer want to be in a nightclub. I look at my phone, it's 5 to 4 in the morning. I definitely don't want to be in a nightclub. At this point in time, and I know for sure that I'm far from being the only semi-jaded party goer looking for an early night. That I 100% agree with. And I think... I'm not sure what it happens with that, right? It's a thing that happens a lot in London. You get You get that feeling that you don't want to be where you are suddenly late at night. I'm not sure if it's because you realize how far the journey is going to be and you miss your 24-hour tube or you have to wait into the morning line. I'm not sure if it's because you realize just who you're around and it's sketching you out a bit. I'm not sure because you realize that maybe you might have money spent. There's something about London nights that tend to kind of make you feel as if you've kind of not let yourself down, but how to describe it? Um, Not let yourself down, but you feel a little bit like uh, you wasted your time, maybe. I don't know. It's just a weird way. I don't know what happens, but usually the way it doesn't happen is if you're out with friends or you're out with a group of people and you're stuck with them the whole night, which doesn't happen often either, right? Because you tend to lose people along the way. But if you're with a good group of people, you tend to kind of, you know, not be that bothered about, you know, where you are. You're just having fun with your friends and stuff. But yeah, I understand the feeling that this guy's talking about where you just get there. You're like, man, I just can't wait to just get in my duvet, right? Or... You're just looking forward to that walk home or to get some fresh air. I don't know what it is. Just some weird... I don't know what happens again. It's just maybe a London thing. Um, It goes on and says the following. Uh, From increasingly numerous array of all-day festivals that see the headliner uh, politely offered a round of applause at 11 p.m. to venues like Giant Steps at the Sushi Sister uh, Spot Brilliant Corner, which is is unfortunately going to close very soon. So I recommend you guys definitely go and check out uh, Giant Steps and Brilliant Corner. Oh, Giant Steps for the most part. Brilliant Corners is um, still there in Dawson. But Giant Steps is closing very, very soon. So definitely check that out before it closes, which specializes in turfing uh, punters out before Love Island wraps up for the evening. It's clear that more of us than ever are clamoring for a way of seeing our favorite DJs without foregoing any beauty sleep. The reasons why clubbers might be drawn to regular doses of afternoon delight are many. Some find the idea of slinking into a subterranean spot long after the midnight a simply terrifying prospect. Others are into the idea of going out for a dance that can't but can't be bothered with all the fuss and faff of arranging a babysitter and then sitting through little... Uh, Jimmy, Jemima's piano recites the morning after, after with the kind of uh, calm down that can, 
they last experienced when Tony Blair was in power. And some just seem to really, really like wearing Hawaiian shirts on rooftops. It takes all sorts. Those Hawaiian shirts with denim shorts and white socks. Oh, kill me. Uh, Paul Bryan, who releases records as Apiento, runs test pressing website. Uh, along with Soft Rock's man Piers Harrison, is a fan of Day Party. The late May bank holiday weekend saw Piers and Paul persuading Washington DC's most dynamic duo, beautiful swimmers, to hot foot it to Peckham Rye, to Hackney Wick, um, to close out the TP Bash Giants Steps in Fine Style. To state the obvious, they just offer such a contrast in traditional daytime partying, says Paul. The daytime party allows breadth musically they don't get in a club, which I mentioned earlier, um, in a couple large event. They also um, they also allow you to find your space and settle just as have generally much have more of a loose experience, which is very true, right? In the nightclub, you're mostly just fist pumping, your elbow to elbow. If you have been a Corsica studio, you know the beauty of Corsica is that it's fucking densely packed, but it's also, you know, densely packed. There's no way to kind of get your spot. You just keep moving, especially if you go to the toilet. You're just going to move around. You're going to find your spot again. But with a day party, you can sort of like post up, get your bag, just chill, you know, have a sandwich whatever you know what i mean and just enjoy your night um it doesn't mean that the music can't be tough or whatever but you can just spend a bit more time getting to that point festivals like belfast notoriously up for it ava are proof that partying while pepper pig is still on doesn't mean you've got to sacrifice the sort of big boozy big room antics that most of us save for after the watershed that ava festival ava festival check that out as well that's i think it's dublin right i'm pretty sure it's dublin one of those places in ireland it looks amazing man the crowd go crazy for the dj so i recommend you check that out too uh still there are certain amounts there are certain sounds that lend themselves particularly nicely to the sort of party that starts during football focus and ends during match of the day. For those of us with uh, a Balearic inclination, the day party, whether it's Rough Dog getting wonky at the port at Pikes or the aficionado chaps treating Manchester's discerning drinkers to a smattering of folk obscurities over a pint of dipper or a quarter of microbrewery has become a core currency. After all, the wafty screamers that you hear a lex or macro roll out in any given set just make more sense when accompanied by sunshine i recommend that too, especially in london sunshine too. it's been so nice these last couple of days but whether you're watching helena hoft at shoreditch and after an early afternoon new one at crank brother east london street party or nts top dog charlie bones taking the softly softly approach to late evening sunrise set the simple pleasure of parting safe in knowledge that you'll be back in bed while in bulk of the country clubbers are cracking into their six can of gnt remains holy joy i recommend that of course a cynic might argue that the day party with its poke bowls boomerang friendly cocktails and strict adherence to council mandate noise policy represents a sanitized take on that life and come to some extent it does but if you're asking this writer to choose between fighting for the future of clubbing as an inherently radical subversive act and not having to crawl out of public chance for 7 a.m looking like a zombie has been dragged through the bushes outside burka and i know which i'm gonna pick i haven't said agree man i just think um there's probably going to be a change, right? We're going to see something change soon with the licensing laws. I don't think it's going to stay the way it is, especially with what's going on at Fold in Canning Town. I think there's so much love and so much appreciation. People are giving that place and people are really trying to push it and make sure it stays around. And, you know, they're, put, they're consistently putting on good lineups. There's a Dex J lineup coming very, very soon. I think maybe other councils are going to see just how good those places are doing. And it's, not, it's in the middle of nowhere, basically, that they're eventually going to offer up more licenses or more late licenses for more places or more clubs or maybe go back to how it was previously because again i'm not very much i'm not even pushing for 24-hour clubs everywhere i would just like most areas in london especially the marquee clubs and main ones right to be open until 3 or 4 a.m like why the why isn't jaguar shoes in shoreditch london in shoreditch right high street open until 4 open until 3 it should be right they're losing money for the most part and partners would love hanging out there same with catch bar next door right those places should be open until three and four. At least those should be. So that when you're sending people out on the streets, they're not getting sent out at that weird hour at 1, 2 a.m. where there's some people still coming back from casual nights out and then you've got people coming out from really big raves. It's just like a weird clash of people. At least if you make them, let them come out at three or four, there's no one really around. If you're out at three or four, you're mostly out because you went to a party somewhere, right? You're not just hanging around. So that would be quite cool to see. But I think we're going to see a change in it. But for now, for the time being, if you want to rave and have a good time, the best way to get around it is to just day party. That's the best thing you can do for now. Um, it's annoying. It might not be the most beneficial thing to do for you. Um, you have to kind of plan your day a bit late, earlier, right? 
Um, Because I know I'm used to sitting at home and, you know, pre-drinking and getting a bit way before I head out. Um, But this will require you to kind of stave off the pre-drinking for the most part and try and get there relatively sober and enjoy the day. Because, you know, it's a day event. You don't want to get completely sloshed. You want to just enjoy it and have a good time, have something to eat. So you're not, you know, lightheaded. And then head home at a reasonable hour. That's a pretty well good way to go about it. And if you're going to do an after hours, you can all go back to yours or later. Do you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, that's something I would like to see more often. And something I've done, I'm doing myself here in London for the most part. I think when I go to Bergheim, um, this or the, in in a month or so, that's what I aim. To, I aim to kind of do the nightlife things that I can't do here over there, and then the kind of daytime party stuff that I can do here. I just do them right. It's not the most spontaneous place in the world. You still have to plan it. I still have to go and raise an advisor and click down attending an event or that malarkey. But it's better than nothing, right? That's that's what you can do. It's better than nothing. I think for the most part. Again, I'm not sure about you guys, but I'm hundred percent agree. It's better than better than nothing anyway out there. I am. Um, what else is on this list that I want to speak about before? I head out. Let me see my list. What else have I got on my list here? Buh, 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 buh. Snap spectacles. Yeah, this is this is a weird one, right? Let's talk about Snapchat. Snapchat are releasing their own spectacles again, version three, I think, the third version of these spectacles that they put out. Um Again, I don't know nothing. I don't know what I'm talking about. So maybe they know more than I do about whether or not these are going to be successful. But they've tried these so much, so over the times, and they just don't seem to be letting go. They seem to be trying all they can to make these spectacle work. And I don't know if they're working so far. I know from the times that I've been out, especially around the area that I live in, there's a lot of younger kids. And whenever I see them using social media or glance at their phone, they're always using Snapchat. So there obviously is an audience there that's still using the app. Um, probably that's why it's still around now i know from slightly glancing at a few headlines that they were completely you know you know turning the tap on the money it was just kind of going 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 on um for the most part but you know they're trying to make it profitable by launching products such as the snap spectacles and hopefully they hope you know if this blows if this goes big that essentially it could be a good way to them to acquire new users too on the platform but i don't know man i don't know so this is an article from The Verge. It says Snap Spectacles. Snap announces Spectacles free with an updated design and a HD camera, which is you know pretty cool. It, you know something that you might see in the Mission Impossible movie, right? Um, but again, some a girl that looked that cool, that cute, wouldn't wear Snap Spectacles. Let's be for real. Like she's never gonna wear those glasses. It's just gonna be for dogs and geeks like me, yeah, <laughs> like me and you. But it says, here's the article. It says the following: um, Snap today um announced uh spectacles free a redesigned um, version of its augmented reality sunglasses with a sleek new design and added hd camera to create depth perception the glasses which the company has positioned as limited release <laughs> of course they do represent snap's latest effort to build a new computing platform centered on the face hmm they will go on sale for spectacles.com and they'll on november and they'll be cost 380 dollars 380 dollars for spectacles i don't know about you guys but i've seen a lot of my friends and a lot of people on the street i'm not sure if you've noticed it but there's been a lot more people out there wearing designer sunglasses right they're not scared to go out and pay 200 pound plus for designer sunglasses or 150 and you know why because that's the price i mentioned earlier designer sunglasses are a lot cheaper than what they used to be um, there's a lot of good entry level sunglasses that you can get out there for 150 and plus. Why would you want to? Why would you swap that for you know for a, a computer on your face? And we're not necessarily in that place yet at the moment. No, no one's really ready for that kind of technology. I don't think so. Really? Are you? I know I'm not. I'm not. And it continues. Um, that makes them more than twice as expensive as last year's model, which was 150. The Snap uh, executives say the higher end version is meant to appeal to a smaller group of fashion forward creative types fashion forward creative types right those are two different crowds and i don't think they would actually want those glasses creative types maybe might be a cool way to kind of you know document there could be a way to like document your design process prototyping and stuff in the studio a fashion creative maybe you could take your fit pics with it i don't know how you get dressed in them i don't know vlogging with it <sighs> It may also it may also be designed to recoup more of its manufacturing costs for the famously money losing product. Snapchat wrote down nearly forty million in costs associated with the first version of the glasses after widely 
overestimating demand. The high price of smokes and ridiculous free will likely limit their appeal, particularly among the high school and college students, which is interesting. They're aiming, they, they're making fashion forward glasses for the creative types. They're pricing it at $380, but the only people that use Snapchat are kids under 21 who don't work in the fashion forward creative industries just yet. This is another evidence that, you know, people will say, oh my God, it's so hard to do this, so hard to do that. Not really. Snapchat is a great company. It's a once in a lifetime idea. Evan Spiegel is, you know, a genius in his own right. But the way they run this company shows you that there are some people out there who are just chancing it for the most part, right? For lack of a better term. They are chances. I don't know. Like, again, they wrote off $40 million in the cost of making the first glasses because they overestimate demand really that isn't like a startup thing that's like a business one-on-one thing so there's they've got no one in their boardroom who's got i don't know an mba that was able to maybe you know forecast this or figure this out like wow the high prices of spectacles free will most likely limit their appeal blah blah blah. that's them in gold and black the article continues the glasses marquee features a second camera which enables spectacles to capture depth for the first time the snappers built suit of new 3D effects to take advantage of the device. The, the glasses will be available in two colors, carbon, black, and mineral, somewhere between beige and gold. They have a lightweight steel frame, adjustable tips, and tinted lenses. Like previous editions, particles allow you to easily capture photos and videos by tapping a button on top of those glasses. Bloody hell, man. They look so bad as those glasses as well, don't they? Um, battery life is un, is, un, is unimproved for the previous edition, though. <laughs> The second camera creates an additional drain on the new spectacles. Uh, must compensate for. Snap says that you'll be able to capture 70 videos. <laughs> it didn't even improve the battery. These guys are fucking taking the piss. A full charge will take 75 minutes and the case can be recharged by USB C. Photos are stored in resolution of the whatever that is. Unfortunately, Snap's taken. With speckles will still don't transfer automatically to your Snapchat account. Snap says that there are still technical hurdles renting for such a transfer. <laughs> These guys are taking a piss. You can't, it, so they don't upload them. So, what, how are you meant to do them? You'll connect your phone to Bluetooth and then, wow. And then, so, here's how you do it in, in the meantime, you'll connect your phone to over Bluetooth or Wi Fi and wait impatiently for your snaps to download to your account. The exception of this is iOS users who are at home on the Wi Fi and have their snap spectacles charging spectacles can be set up to export snaps jesus christ you have to export them this is like this is worse than a mini disc like do you remember that you thought you could drag and drop it and you have to convert it into the actual file that plays it this is horrendous i've abandoned my generation spectacles in previous years within a few weeks primarily for that reason taking snaps and spectacles transferring them onto my phone and only then being able to edit and share them felt like too much work for too little reward introducing a new version of spectacles that almost twice expensive without addressing the flaw of the user experience at least for service like a missed opportunity missed more than missed opportunity mate they are absolutely shit in the show like i don't get that why are they doing that like why would they release something that isn't what people want that's strange isn't it again I guess if you're interested in them, they come out in November. Snap Spectacles, they're for you on the big screen. I'll link it in the show if you guys check it out. Oh, check it out yourself. Spectacles.com. This isn't something I'm going to endorse in the slightest, man. It's an absolute garbage item. Wow. Absolute garbage. I cannot believe it, how bad that is. It drains the battery. It doesn't upload directly on there. Um... You can't edit them. Like, why can't you just edit in the lenses? What's the whole point of having a computer? It's not really a computer in your face, then, is it? It's just a camera on your face. It's like, well, anyway, it is now late. Thanks so much for tuning in to your Zinger show. That was a good way to end it. Uh, snap spectacles are diabolical. Um, as always, thanks so much for tuning in. All info regarding myself, DJ gigs, um, DJ mixes, all that reliable can be found on my website, which is agsnozinger.com. Link will be in the show notes description below. I'm also on Patreon, by the way, if you want to support the show on Patreon and ensure that I go out and buy a new camera and upgrade my RAM on my computer because at the moment it's all about good, 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 good. Um, click the link on the Patreon, um, donate what you can, and that'll go a long way into ensuring this show continues going and I get better equipment along the way. 
if you want to support that do that if you're watching video youtube and it's your first time here give me a little thumbs up and if you want to hang around some more why not subscribe if you're watching or listening actually via the podcast app on your smartphones why not leave me a five-star review this goes a long way into ensuring people uh, find the show give me a like if you're watching listening via the itunes app or that malarkey interact check me out via the email if you want to um, communicate and ask me questions link can also be found on my website which is com. more information there but until then my friends until we meet again thanks so much for tuning in hope you have a great rest of your day all that malarkey and i'll see you guys again very 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 soon peace take care hasta luego